Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on our grant webinar with the Minority Business Development Agency. Today we have Joanne Hill. She is the Chief at the Office of Business Development at the MBDA. We have Susie Choi joining us, Assistant Director the, from the LA MBDA Business Center. And we have Andrew Barrera, Procurement Relationship Manager with the Los Angeles MBDA Business Center as well. Um, we would like to thank you all for joining us to our um, MBDA, and we hope that you find more information, more resources today on Minority Business Development Agency grant opportunities and funding opportunities. So we will go ahead and get started with um, Joanne Hill's presentation. So let me know if you can see my screen. Joanne, can you All see right. the screen? Yes. Thank you so much. And it is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. And again, I'm Joanne Hill. I serve as Chief of the Office of Business Development here at the U.S. Department of Commerce Minority Business Development Agency. At MBDA, our mission is to support the growth and global competitiveness of minority business enterprises throughout the United States of America. We are the only federal agency that is specifically designed to foster the growth and global competitiveness of these firms through three pillars, access to contracts, access to capital, and access to markets. During our fiscal, uh, if you could go back one slide, please. During fiscal year 20, um, we helped a number of MBEs. It is important to note that there are more than 9.2 million minority-owned businesses located throughout America. They employ more than 8 million individuals, and they've generated more than $1.8 trillion in economic output into the U.S. economy. Our agency is anchored on three pillars, including expanding the U.S. economy, strengthening local communities, and supporting greater job creation here at home. Next slide. Our vision is to create the conditions for economic growth and opportunity for all communities. And our mission, again, is that we are the only federal agency that is specifically designed to foster growth and global competitiveness of minority business enterprises. Next slide. What we do. We help entrepreneurs of color achieve business dreams. For example, we provide technical assistance and by this technical assistance, we provide business development services through our national network of business centers, programs, and initiatives. These centers help these MBEs with both traditional as well as alternative sources of capital they help them with contracts, including public and private sector contracts, and they help them with market opportunities. And those market opportunities are both domestic and global market opportunities. In the US, we have a burgeoning economy with regard to, I'm sure you've heard about the bilateral infrastructure uh, law and all of the contracts that are stemming uh, more than a trillion dollars in spend from that law for construction projects, uh, broadband, and other major infrastructure efforts that are taking place. Uh, we also help our companies that are seeking to do business internationally through exports. We have pilot projects where we stimulate the growth of minority-owned firms through innovative projects that provide new and innovative solutions to overcome unique challenges that MBEs face. We have an inner city innovation hub project currently with Georgia Tech and Rice University out in Houston. Georgia Tech, of course, is in the state, is in the state of Georgia, located in the city of Atlanta. With regard to research and data, we serve a, we, MBDA serves as a clearinghouse for data and research for and about minority owned businesses. Our evidence-based research informs policy recommendations. 
to date, I'm very proud to announce that we recently completed our minority business data sheets. So for those of you wanting to know how many MBEs are there by state in a given state, uh, we have that data on our website under our research and development. We also re just recently completed a report on the state of minority business. We now have an Office of Policy Analysis and Development where we will be generating even more research and studies for and about minority businesses in the near future. And a little bit about the MBE ecosystem. MBDA facilitates ecosystem development by leveraging public-private partnerships and launching national initiatives. We convene and engage the MBE ecosystem through national events such as, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, our National Med Week and by MBE Day. National Med Week, for those of you who may or may not be as familiar with the agency, will take place in about three weeks. It will be held here in Washington, D.C. You can find out more about the Midweek Conference and get registered if you're interested by visiting our website at www.medweek.gov. Midweek is a national conference. It's the federal government's foremost annual gathering and celebration of some of the nation's most successful entrepreneurs. We honor them and we recognize them through an award ceremony. We also share with you the latest regarding current industry trends, key resources, and tools to help grow your business with regard to the speakers that we invite to attend. We have a business to business matchmaker with both public and private sector acquisition officials. Again, Midweek is going to be held September the 18th through the 24th at the Washington Hilton on the National Mall at the Wharf here in Washington, D.C. And our theme for this year's conference is Power in Capital, Strength in Equity. Next slide, please. Who we serve. Again, you saw that I mentioned earlier that we have a mission to serve more than 9.2 million MBEs. Our clients are minority-owned businesses that are operated by African Americans, Asian Americans, Hasidic Jews, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders. Traditionally, our programs serve MBEs that generate revenues of at least $500,000 or more. Next slide, please. MBDA then and now. So a little bit about how the agency has evolved over the past 53 years. We were established back in 1969 by executive order 11458, which created the Office of Minority Business Enterprise or OMBI. In 1979, the Office of Minority Business Enterprise became the, the name that you know us for today, the Minority Business Development Agency. And most notably, one of our proudest moments that I'm happy to share in 2021, the President of the United States, President Biden, signed a bill making the Minority Business Development Agency permanent. So we are no longer, and we no longer exist by executive order, but as a permanent agency. So we cannot be struck out with a pen with the new administration that comes in. And we are very proud of that. And we are evolving. With the passage of the authority that made MBDA permanent in 2021, the agency now has an undersecretary. We also will be expanding our footprint of business centers, rural business centers as well, as well as other programmatic expansion. You will hear more about that if you follow and keep up with us as we continue to spread our wings to fly even broader and wider uh, to help you grow and expand your businesses. Next slide, please. Again, a little bit about the act. So uh, the act was again passed in 2021. The codification 
again made us permanent and evaluate and elevated us in statute stature here at the department. We will also be decentralizing. Uh, some of you might have remembered, if you know about MBDA, we used to have regional offices before we centralized about a decade ago. This authorization is going to take the agency back to having boots on the ground and troops on the ground, if you will, uh, with regard to our equities that are out in the field. Those regional offices will be opening in the future as a part of our expansion. We will also be continuing to expand our programs. Notably, you heard me talk about the Rural Business Center program, expansion of our flagship business program that we've had since inception. We will also be expanding an entrepreneurship education program, more partnerships with minority colleges and universities, and more initiatives and more special initiatives uh, centered on access to capital, access to contracts, and other efforts. We also will have, notably, an MBE Advisory Council. This advisory council will be established as, an, as a council to advise the undersecretary on issues that relate to supporting minority business enterprises. Next slide, please. Our investments. We have a national network of investments, and this is a list that does not include, we had a competition that just, a grant competition, three of them that just closed within the last 60 days. But this is a snapshot before the others are announced. But as you can see, you have a listing here of our flagship business center programs uh, that are located in 35 states. We have nine specialty centers that includes export centers, advanced manufacturing centers, as well as a federal procurement center. And then we have other initiatives and grants that we offer. We have notably an Enterprising Women of Color program. We have five of those, and you'll see where they're located here in the slide. And you can find all of this on our website, how to reach out to them, as well as how to contact them. We also have 13 American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian projects that are located throughout the nation. Other initiatives also notably includes our entrepreneurship education for formerly incarcerated persons, minority colleges and universities. That program will be expanding with the grant competition that you just heard me talk about that just closed. We will be adding seven additional minority colleges and universities to that portfolio, the inner city innovation hubs. And then lastly, our MBE equity multiplier project, which is our part of our access to capital portfolio. And that too will be expanding by two additional investments that will be announced within the next uh, few weeks. We will also be notably expanding our business center programmatic footprint. So we will go from 35 business centers, and that's our flagship business center program, we will be adding an additional six. So we will go from 35 to 41 flagship business center programs. So as you can see, our wings are already continuing to e expand and we, we are going to be doing even more of that into the future under the permanency uh, of the organization. Next slide, please. Our performance. So you say, how do you measure? In fiscal year 21, the agency generated $708 million in financing for our clients. In the area of access to contracts, we generated more than $2 billion for our clients. And with regard to market access for global markets slash exports, we helped our firms to, we facilitated more than $330 million in export transactions. So as you can see, we have been busy at work and we overall, we generated overall just over $3 billion in awarded transactions for the clients that we serve. Next slide, please. Federal resources and the recovery from COVID 
uh, pandemic. As you know, many firms were impacted by the pandemic and it's still having a ripple effect and impact on those clients. In 2020, Congress uh, appropriated funding for us to $10 million for us to support these firms through our business centers and national minority and five national minority chambers of commerce. They re-upped the funding in FY21 with an additional appropriation of 25 million that was to assist these firms that had been impacted by the pandemic and to help prevent Oh, my goodness. Looks like we lost Joanne for a few seconds there. We'll wait for her to get back on. If not, we can proceed with Susie's presentation. Okay, just let us know. If can. I will. Well, thankfully, that was the last slide that she had. There was only the um, ending slide with the contact information for the Minority Business Development Agency. The website is here, and we'll also make sure to put it in the chat. And this is a phone number as well. If you'd like to write it down, we will provide it in the chat as well. Um, Susie, we can go ahead and start with your presentation. I will stop sharing my screen, so you can go ahead and start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew, if you can help pull up the slides and our presentation, that would be great. Okay, it's not letting me do it. Okay, here we go. It's... Great. Yeah. So I want to say, first of all, um, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you're joining from. I am really happy and excited to be here today. And really, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to first thank the congressman, his team, Ms. Hill and MBDA for inviting us here today to talk more about uh, the services and the resources that are offered through our Los Angeles MBDA Business Center. So thank you so much for that. Uh, my name, as I mentioned earlier, is Susie Choi. I am the Assistant Director of Pace Business Department, as well as the operator of our Los Angeles MBDA Business Center. And I'm also joined here today by my colleague, Andrew Barrera, our Procurement Relationships Manager. And really, um, before we get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, what I really like to do is give a high level overview of our organization, Pacific Agent Consortium and Employment, otherwise known as PACE. We are a nonprofit community development corporation founded in 1976 to really help meet the economic challenges of five different categories. So it's employment, education, environment, business, and housing. Um, today, we do have five separate departments that are dedicated to each of its corresponding categories. However, today, um, we will just fo focus solely on our business department. Um, our business department was actually established in 1993 to really help small businesses expand and to stabilize their business, as well as to help aspiring entrepreneurs launch their business. Um, our Los Angeles MBDA business falls under the umbrella of our business department, and we really serve all of Southern California, um, but mainly our clients are really coming from Central Los Angeles, South Bay, and San Gabriel Valley. Uh, next slide, please. So under our business department, and especially through our Los Angeles MBDA Business Center, we have a team of 23 that can provide a full range of technical assistance services, and that can um, span from one-on-one -on -one small business counseling to our entrepreneurial training program, to our workshops and training, and also through our um, CDFI, Community Development Financial uh, Institution, Pace Finance Corporation, we can also originate small business loans ranging from $500 to $750,000. We also can do uh, credit repair and credit building loans. And we also offer SBA micro and community advantage loans, EDA loans, as well as our own in-house disaster loan programs with flexible terms. And lastly, um, but not, 
not least importantly, um, we also provide procurement services. And through our procurement services, um, it runs a gamut from assistance but capability statements to business certifications to bid proposals and budget strategies. And really, I'm, I'm just scratching the surface here, but this topic really um, deserves a deeper dive because from our experience, we've seen that um, procurement, it really has the potential to help businesses expand and grow. And with that said, I would like to now introduce our procurement expert, Andrew Barrera. Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for the invitation to the, the Congressional Office and our uh, national MBDA. Uh, here at PACE, uh, specifically under the MBDA program, uh, as you know, uh, we service minority contractors um, that make half a million dollars or more. However, if you don't qualify there, we also operate a program through GoBiz, through the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, that we can still help you with procurement. And when we talk about procurement, it, it, we're really talking about how do you source contracts? How do you generate business? So generally under procurement and under the MBDA program, uh, we will help you source contracts. Uh, what I'm gonna do is an abbreviated version of our typical two hour workshop and try to do it in 30 minutes. But uh, the goal is for you to understand that there are billions of dollars of contract opportunities out there. And in uh, the government and the utilities and the private sector, they buy everything. So everything that the general public uh, purchases or contracts for, so does all those entities that I had just mentioned. So it's all going to really start with, are you contract ready? Because myself as a former buyer for a, a local city, um, you know, it's a risk to give contracts out to businesses. I have to make sure that you can perform on time and on budget. And there was a saying that we say that, that we used to say, not only can you achieve to perform on the contract, but you can exceed uh, the be able to, to perform. So when we look at contract ready, uh, there, as you could see here, you need to make sure that you have the financial stability, you have a staffing plan, you have uh, uh, equipment, uh, that you have experience in, in servicing contracts in the past, that you're able to scale that, uh, and that you're in a position of growth. So keep in mind when it comes to uh, procurement and supplier diversity uh, programs, they are designed as a business development strategy to allow uh, diverse businesses to be able to get into the marketplace, to perform, to grow, to scale, uh, to a point where uh, you may not need a small business certification. But we're going to get into all of that shortly. So as you can see here, small businesses, uh, they fall into these different tiers. So a tier one is a prime contract. So just keep in mind that if you register and a supplier uh, uh, vendor portal, you want to register both as a prime contractor and as a subcontractor. Because there could be contracts that are within your wheelhouse that you'll be able to perform. You'll be the only contractor on that particular uh, uh, service, and so you'd be a prime contractor. A tier two contractor would be, let's say we have a large construction company, let's say like Burns and McDonald or, or, or Turner, and they're looking for some specialties like uh, electricians and plumbing and carpentry. So that would, those contractors are tier two contractors. And then you have tier three and tier four, because they could be suppliers, you could be a specialist, that, that's uh, performing one type of service uh, on the overall contract, but it's, un it's very important that you understand what tier your business or your product falls under when you're looking to do contract with the government. Okay, excuse me. Okay, so this is when you know that you're contract ready. Now I'm gonna throw a lot of information at you, uh, out there at you, but please keep in mind, I, I, we look at it like books in a bookshelf where each category is a special thing that we need to understand and it'll help us organize our thoughts and our strategies and our business development approach moving forward. So basically it's all gonna start with one thing. You're bringing your A game. You're bringing a high quality product or service to the table. 
so that's where it's going to start. Uh, if if you feel that you do not feel confident enough that you're able to compete, then maybe you shouldn't. However, the biggest thing that we want to encourage you is to have co confidence in yourself, your product, your service, your, your key skilled staff, and that you're current in the market, in your industry. Now, we, we all can learn and we all can grow, and we do as time goes on. And even when we land on contracts, we find us, we may have some challenges that we overcome. That's how we learn and that's how we grow. And so that's the one thing that we want to make sure that you develop confidence, that you understand your industry, and that you're bringing a high quality service or product to the game. Uh, I have here websites and marketing to show your value proposition. So as a procurement officer, if I'm looking at your proposal or I'm looking at your capability statement to see, are you qualified? I'm only not only gonna look at that, but I'm gonna look at your website. I'm gonna look at whatever marketing materials that you have, because I need to take a deeper dive to really understand that you are worth the risk, that you're qualified, and that you deserve an opportunity to perform on this contract. Those are all very important things. A capability statement. We're going to go into that in a little bit. A capability statement is like a, a factual statement, like a factual resume of who you are. Now, keep in mind, uh, let's say your business has only been in existence five years and they're looking for 10 years of, of experience. Well, keep in mind, your professional experience or your partner's professional experience or some of your key staff you can also include that because if you've performed that in a past job or your employers or your other con subcontractors have done it in the past, that means your company can do that now. So it's, let's not limit ourselves. Let's see what we're, what we're made of and what our experience are uh, uh, and uh, our professional experience and, and skills that we're bringing to the table. Uh, can you demonstrate your ability to fulfill a contract? So generally, if you're a startup and you haven't had too many contracts, uh, maybe you're not going to be able to do that unless we can hire skilled staff or we can subcontract or we can uh, joint venture with another company. And that shows that we do have the capacity to perform on a contract and to fulfill it. Small business certifications. That's a very important thing. So the small business certification program, now there's not one that fits all. So the federal government has theirs, the state has theirs, the county, the city, even the private sector has uh, uh, small business certifications. You're not gonna get a contract because you have a small business certification. You're gonna get the contract because you have a high quality product or skill. However, uh, if it comes between you and I, and we're both competing and we're equally qualified, and you have the certification and I don't, chances are you're going to get the contract because you're going to give you extra points or a discount on your proposal. And there's our, our a special local preference. So we need to understand the value of small business certifications and how they're utilized. We're going to tap into that shortly. Uh, enrolling your company in major vending portals. You know, if you are not registered and you don't know what your next codes are, which is a special number, for every service that's provided or product that's provided, uh, provided in, in, in the country, you're not gonna get a notification. And it's gonna make your uh, search for contract sourcing much more difficult. Uh, also, uh, do you have a contractor development program? Are you involved? So like, as I had mentioned, you know, like, like for plumbers and electricians and distributors and suppliers, they can be a subcontractor to a, a larger uh, venture. That's why it's important that we understand what are the opportunities out there and where do I fit? So clearly to have a subcontractor development strategy moving forward is a very important uh, uh, avenue to be able to generate contracts and resources. Uh, do you have any relationships with primes or government procurement officers? You know, remember these governments and big companies are not just that. They're made up of people, and we, it's based on relationships. And all of us who've developed contracts in the past is because somebody took a chance on us or we knew somebody. And so that's why it's really, really important that as part of your business development strategy, you meet prime contractors. 
You introduce yourself. You let them see what you're bringing to the table. Same thing with procurement officers, whether it's in the government or in the private sector. And, uh, and understand, as I had mentioned, as we grow, we want to perfect our business model to incorporate what we call best business practices. Okay, so one thing when we want to, we, we need to know that the entire company, country is managed by numbers. We have bank accounts, we've got driver's license numbers, uh, you name it. Well, the same thing with procurement. And when you register uh, as a business, when you get your articles of incorporation, you become a corporation, you get a corporate number. Okay. What I have here, next codes, is very, very, very important. Um, and I've seen some companies that only have one or two. Oh, I'm a, I'm a plumber, or I'm a, I'm a IT web designer, and they only have one. But when you register into the vendor portals, there could be probably five or six other types of contracts that you can perform upon. That because you don't have the next code in there, you're never getting notified that there was an opportunity for you. So if you come to the MBDA centers, we're going to help you find those. And we're going to try to think out of the box. Because so if you're an IT professional, well, you're also a uh, business management consultant expert. So that's another code. So we're going to help you understand that. So right now, uh, very important for those of you that are thinking about federal contracting, uh, there used to be the DUNS number. There's no more DUNS number. Now it's called the Unique Identity Identifier. And we can find that on the SAM system at the federal government portal that manages all the contracts uh, throughout the country, federal contracts. That's what you want to do. And uh, also I have here SAMs. So they handle all business, whether it's a multi-billion dollar contracts or, or a $1,000 contract. The SAM system is the entity that manages all that. Then I have here commercial cage code that's more related to geographical areas where your contracts uh, are located. Okay, now we're gonna go into capability statement. A capability statement, I'm gonna have a couple samples here, is a fact sheet resume of who you are. It's not a promo piece to say, we're the best and we do the, the, the fastest job. That is not what this is about. As a procurement officer, it's a bare bones that I can look in that and see, what do you do? Okay, what are your core competencies? What are the core products and services you provide? What is your past performance? What have you done this kind of work before? What are all the relevant next codes and certifications or special uh, contractors license that you may have? So it's right to the point and it's organized and it's generally on a one pager and I want it to be easy to read. If I see a bunch of gobbledygook on there, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you're, you're wasting my time. I'm gonna look for somebody that understands that I need you to help me identify easily what I'm looking for, okay? Prime contractors and, and, and procurement officers, they'll collect them. So me as a former uh, a buyer for a city that's looking for contractors, I had the contract one that, uh, me, I had a prime contractor that was performing the service, but I wanted a backup of at least three or four or five other qualified vendors that just in case something happened, I can I can go to them, or if I'm going to expand regionally and or increase services, that I can also include them. So the capability statement is an industry standard that is very important that you have. Okay, it's it's very much like a resume. You know, if I'm going to submit a resume for a job that's looking for IT, why am I going to put all my sales talk? I'm not my sales positions. I'm gonna answer the question based on the industry that I'm servicing. So this is a live document that can be tailored to go after whoever your target contract market would be. And as you can see, it's a, a marketing tool that establishes your qualifications and your credentials. Okay, so here's the, the, the sections that are made up. Now, the one thing that's important about a capability statement, it requires you to take a deep dive and take a look at yourself. What am I bringing to the table? It will help you is doing self-analysis of where I'm strong and where I am, I'm challenged. And where I'm challenged, then I'm gonna either get the training, hire the skilled staff, find a subcontractor or joint venture. But this is a very important document 
to take a look in the mirror to see who, who I really am, not who I want to be, who I am right now. So you can see here, basically it's uh, a brief com uh, company uh, summary of who you are, basically it's a one paragraph of who you are, how long your business, what your expertise is, what industry you are, uh, um, you know, and maybe some skilled uh, uh, positions you're in. Core competencies, the things that you do the best. And we want to list them from the things that's going to make you the most money to at least going to help you get to your will buy line. And then we could also include areas where we think we're going to develop into. That way, a buyer will look at this and say, well, I only looking for A, B, C, and D right now, but I realize you can do some of these other things that we're thinking about doing in the future. So we need to think out of the box. We need to be a little bit more critical thinkers when we're communicating anything about our company and our service. Then you have differentiators. Uh, this is, you know, what's the difference here? Well, you know, what makes us different than other companies is that we do quality uh, control checks on a weekly basis, that we report on a weekly basis. Even though our contracts is monthly, we just want to show that we're a little bit different. We're on the game. And we have some special, we have some Six Sigma uh, analysis on our staff. Even though it's not needed, we're displaying that we are we have a value added that we're bringing to the game. So we're going to give you exactly what you want, but we, we're bringing more tools to perform that what you're looking for. Uh, company data, very important. I don't know how many times I've seen capability statements or even proposals that had antiquated data, wrong emails, uh, wrong addresses. So it's real important that if you're looking to get a contract, we want to make sure that we're communicating that we everything is factually on point, that we're we everything we have a point of contact. This is where we're at. Here's our our our, our all, all of our company data that that uh, allows us to be to be bounded in the contract. Uh, professional formatted. That's very important. I've seen some of that really bare bones. I'm going to tell you the more aesthetically pleasing it is. Okay the better it's going to be. So here's a sample of a capability statement. This is an IT company. You can see they have a, a photo of uh, maybe one of their offices. You can see they have their company information, all their next codes, all in this blue section. It talks about their core markets. This is very a, a very professionally well done capability statement. This is the type of thing that I want to see. And this is the type of thing that shows your pride in your company and what you're bringing to the table. So if you're just throwing text and language out there, I'm gonna tell you, oh, okay, that's great. You made it easy for me to read. But when I see something like this, it shows a different level of pride in your company, a different skill set, And it shows respect to me as a, as, a, as a reader, as a buyer, that you care about what I think and how I, I'm perceiving. Uh, here's another sample. Here's a, a person who was a veteran. Okay, they clearly they say they sell uh, bolts and nuts and products to the government. And if you could see here under core competency, so they went ahead and under here they said certified and it has all these different military certifications of product. So me, if I'm a government buyer and I'm looking for a certain product, I don't have to I don't have to research. Okay, do they do this? Do they do that? Do they have this kind of certification? I, I put it out there right off the bat. And this is real important. So you know, we can help you at the MBDA centers understand, become more critical thinkers, try to bring out more information about yourself, your history, your past professional history, your staff, your partners. All of that is critical information that we need to be able to present. Okay, let's talk about small business certifications. Now, as I had mentioned, you are not going to get a contract just because you have a small business certification. I get a lot of people that they, they go, companies, and they get their contract, and then they're expecting that the contracts are going to come to them. Absolutely not. When I operated my company, I didn't have any small business certifications. However, if I was to go back and reopen my company again, I'm going to get every single one I could get my hands on. And we need to do it in a prudent strategy moving forward. If I'm not gonna do government contracts with the federal government, 
then I'm not going to go get a federal government certification, 8A or a woman-owned small business. You know, maybe I need to wait for a year as I scale. So we need to make sure that depending on what level of government or our, our, our private sector or utility companies that we're going to go after, then we're going to put, then those are the certifications that we're going to get in the beginning. So right here I have here, this is how certifications are, are utilized. So number one, if it's a public works or a government contract, it is mandatory for the government to set aside a percentage of their contracts to go to diverse businesses. It's not a set aside. If you really think about it, by opening up the door to more companies, it increases the vendor pool. New ideas, fresh thinking, new methodologies, different perspectives. We need that in the marketplace whether it's a government buyer uh, or the public sector. So this is really a business development strategy. So as you can see here, you know, uh, it's a mandatory requirement. So let's say for instance, state of California, uh, small business and small business public works, 25% of all the contracts need to go to diverse businesses. Okay, so you can see, so if you have that certification, you're gonna get extra points on your proposal. You and I are equally qualified. You got the certification, I don't. They're gonna give you, who knows, five to 10 extra points just on the scoring of your proposal. Local preference, that's another way it's utilized. Local, it, it's important because look, if I have a service area, I wanna give contracts to people in my service area. That's a public policy. That means we're, we're creating jobs in my service area where the money that's getting paid out and salaries and, or in product purchases is gonna go within my jurisdiction. So it only makes sense that I could give you, I, I want my money to circulate in my area. And, 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 and if I work for LA County, that's what I want. It doesn't mean that if you're from Ventura County that you can't provide a better product, I'm still gonna take a hard look at you. But keep in mind, this is how the certifications are work. So I, I, a former uh, a company of mine that I used to work for called me to help them put a proposal together for one of the college districts here. First thing I did when I looked at the RFP is how did they score it? And I found out that if any of the companies were within a five mile radius or one of the college campuses, they got five extra points for each campus that they may be by. That could be the difference when people are equally qualified. And then lastly, a discount. So this morning, uh, there was a, a, the World Airports LAX did a workshop and they talked about a discount. So if you have a certain certification, which was the DBE, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise certification, uh, they automatically give you a 10% discount on your contract. So here I have 15%. So LA County, let's just use them as an example. So we're, we, we, you and I are tied. You put a bid in at 100 grand, I put a bid in at 90 grand. If, if we're equally qualified, I represent the, ver, the, the, the better value because I save the government 10 grand, I can do the same work. However, you have that certification, the local small business enterprise certification, I don't, they're gonna give you a 15% discount on your 100 grand for, for scoring purposes. Now your contract comes in at 85 grand, mine comes at 90. For scoring purposes only, you represent the better value and you'll still get the 100 grand. So remember, so in order to get a certification, because potentially this could lead to millions of dollars in time, uh, it's based on the qualifying individual or individuals. So let's say it's a woman business enterprise and they want to go for a contract. Uh, it'll say in the federal government, it's a woman owned small business. And there's three partners, two women and one gentleman. Well, the two women, Combined, say they're 33 and 33, so they're 66% of, of ownership. Well, them combined will represent the qualifying individual. And the qualifying individual, okay, who's gonna get this certification that could lead to millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in time, they have to be the main person that's making the decisions, uh, the business decisions that can bind the company, that can uh, uh, that is directing the business, and generally high uh, possesses one of the higher positions, either CEO or COO. 
So a chief operating officer. So the qualifying individual is very important. As you can see here, there are a ton of different certifications. We will help sort that out for you. you go to any one of the MBDA centers, we will help you understand, depending on the level, government level of contract, which ones to get. Now, as I had mentioned, so like for the city of LA and the county of Los Angeles, we're just using them as an example, 25% of all the contracts need to go to small business enterprises. That's number two here. That's the highest goal. Minority and women may be between eight and 6% goal. So business sense says, let's go for the highest certification possible. However, in order to become a client with us in the MBDA, let's go ahead and let's go get that MBDE certification. And we'll try to help you strategize on how to use that. But as you can see, there are many here. So we need to make sure that we put a good strategy moving forward on what certifications to go for to secure based on what government contracts that we think that we can get. You can see here's some goals, federal contracting goals. So the small business, 23% of all federal contracts need to go to the SB certification. You have disadvantaged business owners, 5%. Women, um, 5%. Hub zone, 3%. Disabled veterans. Okay, and that's not only to be a veteran, you need to be a service disabled veteran to get the certification. So you say, well, those looks kind of small, but when you look at the trillions of dollars of contracts that the, the federal government gives out, that is a lot of opportunity for us. State of California, as I mentioned, the SBE, 25%, public works, 25%, veterans, 3%, Caltrans, uh, transportation, okay, that's a little bit different. So when you get this certification, the DBE, this event is business enterprise. It's actually the U.S. Department of Transportation, which is the sanctioning authorizing body. So this money through Caltrans, which is the California uh, department, gets federal monies. And so they're held to the same type of standard in contract issuing contracts and, and, and to diverse businesses. And as you can see here. Okay, so when you apply for the small business certifications, this is basically the list of documents that you're going to need. And this is important because if you're a good, prudent business manager, if I'm going to give you the contract, I not only can you perform the service at a high level, but I want to see that you have the ability to manage your business at a high level. And managing your businesses at a high level includes you having your, your ducks in a row, your corporate, uh, your, your, your corporate book whether it's a LLC or a corporation, S Corp or C Corp, you have your articles, your bylaws, your stock ledgers, okay? You have a business license or a contractor's license. They're gonna to wanna to see tax returns for three years. You say, well, I don't have three years, I only have two. Well, they're gonna give the two business years and your, your third year of your person, okay? They're gonna see financial statements, year to loss, profit loss statement, okay? A balance sheet, maybe accounts receivable. These are things that you need to have in place to show that you are a prudent business manager, that you're an effective business manager. You know how to operate your company, that your business infrastructure is in place to help you scale. Resumes of you and your key staff. And they're gonna, they're gonna also wanna see your personal financial statement because we don't want multimillionaires trying to take advantage of this program and say, well, I'm just a small startup business that's only been in existence three years, I need the certification. No, that because if they're going to vet you, they're going to want to make sure that the right entities are getting these certifications. They're designed for people like ourselves. Okay, uh, proof of investment. We don't want a shell company. We need to know that you got skin in the game. Yeah, I just bought a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment, or I incorporated and I I I've got twenty thousand dollars of my own money in, in, in our business account. That shows that you're vested that these are criteria steps to show that you are a valid business. A lease, okay, and a bank signature card. You have a business bank signature card. That's important because we don't want to see you co-mingling money. Okay, but these are basic documents that we have. Vendor portal registrations. This is incredibly important. Now, you know, we're going to start off with the city of LA, the county of LA, city of uh, San Diego, uh, the city of Sacramento, we're going to roll in their vendor portals with all our next codes. And then we're going to go for our certifications and start listing them there as well. However, now we're going to go to the city of Long Beach. We're going to Ventura County. 
We're going to go to the state. We're going to register in the federal government. We may go to Nevada. So we want to expand the portal registration that gives us the broadest opportunity to get notifications of contracts that we can perform upon. And uh, so that's what, that's what vendor portals do. It's also very important because prime contractors are buyers within the different departments. So the state of California has 250 uh, different departments that all have procurement needs. It will allow those department heads or those prime contractors to find you in, registered in the system. And they can actually just send uh, opportunities just to you. They call it unsolicited RFP solicitations, where they don't have to go to the great general public. They could just go to this, this supplier vendor portal itself and find you and just send you the opportunity. <coughs> Excuse me. As you can see here, it's a contractor and a subcontractor. Excuse me. What's important about this, it allows you to research prime contractors that you could introduce yourself or, or potential subcontractors that you could joint venture with, or you could look at those subcontractors and see what they're doing. And if they're doing something that you can do, you can incorporate it as long as you're not still in intellectual property, you know, but, uh, but you could see that's such a valuable thing. You could also look for contract opportunities. I say, look up for open and closed because the close opportunities we can look at to see contract cycles. So this could be a two-year contract that's coming up again. And that's exactly what we do. Well, I'm gonna make sure on my master calendar that I'm jotting down that this contract potentially could come out. And if you're not registered in the portal, you'll never see it and you'll never get the notification for it. And, uh, and you can see here it matches next codes. So this is the benefit here. You got your next code here and a copper opportunity comes up. They're gonna look at that number. And those platforms have a bid match component that's going to identify that number and they're going to send you the RFP. So you need to make sure that you're looking at the RFPs that are being sent. If it doesn't fit, then you look at it and you move on to the next. One. But just keep that in mind. They're very important programs. Okay, so here's for the federal government under the SAM system. Um, you want to go here, you want to register. You can see in the big red button here. Okay, and then you can say start or, or, or renew. So on SAM, I think you need to do it every year, okay? But this is what you want to do because there's billions of dollars of opportunity. Just in the state, of, oh, here's also with the GSA, uh, the government services. So this is the main thing that buys everything for the government. You can also go here. You say, I want to sell. I want to register my business. I'm going to put my, uh, my, uh, my next codes in there. You're going to have your uh, unique identity identifier number. It's going to go in there. Once you get that, it should auto-populate. But this is the two the portals that the federal government uses. Okay, state of California. We estimated here in the state of California there was probably $120 billion worth of contract, contract opportunities in uh, 2021. And so that's incredibly important. As you can see here, you're going to go to sell, register your business. Now here they use a little bit different thing as the United Nations, uh, uh, I don't have the whole name right now, uh, code that they use. So they don't necessarily use next codes, but if you contact us, we can help you research those codes that here in the state of California that they use. And you can see here, here it says start search. You could research contract opportunities. There's a lot of support here. You wanna get the certifications, you can see here get certified. There's training resources. There's generally as an advocate, uh, that work for the state to help small businesses get registered and to look for contracts, they have that. And we're all here as well to help you do that. Okay, here's the County of Los Angeles. Uh, same thing here, the County of LA, I think they do close to $9 billion a year in, in contract. Okay, so uh, that's a great opportunity for us to expand the, the, the net that we're casting out there to find out uh, contract up. And if we're not doing this type of thing, then you know, you're know you what we call a legacy business. You're, you're not growing, you're not progressing, you're not trying to learn new ways and methods of contract sourcing that we can get in the game. And uh, so that's what we're here to help you. All the MBDA centers are here to help you. Okay, those send, uh, LA. Now LA just changed their system from a city owned opportunity, which I think they do about uh, close to $7 uh, billion in contracts a year. 
they made it into a regional. So almost any private sector, a utility company, a, a county, uh, private sector, uh, other cities, they can all go on the RAMP system, which is a regional alliance marketplace for procurement. You need to register in these places so you can get notifications of contract opportunities, do your research, that, you know, and that's going to help you. That an effective business manager that's trying to just develop new contract opportunities and 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 service revenues. Uh, that's what you need to register with. Planet Bid. This is one that you have to pay for. Right before I came to my company Pace, uh, I had to reopen my business because I found out there was an opportunity to do a transportation contract. I used to be a trans deputy before with assembly. And uh, uh, a, a friend of mine says, hey, you got to go try for this contract. I said, man, I haven't done that work in, in, in 15 years. And he goes, well, go on there, look at it. So I registered. And then I found out that city of Anaheim, uh, uh, there's a ton of small business cities that uh, use Planet Bid. So and I want to increase the opportunities. And so there's a few pace, uh, sites like BidSync and Planet Bid. And there's, a, there's, there's a, a few more that may be worth. Let's go get registered in the free ones first. And then as we start becoming more mature and understand the protocols of, of procurement, then we start expanding. Okay. Uh, so when you go into the sites, we're almost finished. So when we go into the sites, we could look up opportunities either by next codes because we know what they are. So my next code is this number, 238210. I could go plug that number in, any of them, except for the state, we've got to put a different code in there. And, and opportunities will show up. Remember, look for open and closed because we want to know the closed cycles. Is that Does that agency buy or does that uh, utility company or that company buy what I sell is number one. And if I don't see too many opportunities, then I'm going to move on. I'm not going to waste a lot of time. But you could do it. You could either buy next code or you could put by word. And you put the word and then it'll show that if there's an opportunity. There. And then, or if you happen to know uh, an actual RFP number uh, that somebody may have told you, look this number up in, in LA's ramp. I look it up and, uh, and the opportunity will show there as well. Okay, proposals. Now, uh, we do a whole workshop just on proposals. But this is, this is how you're going to get the contract. And basically, this is a, a summary checklist of things that you would need to be competitive, okay, and, uh, and, and, and to make the short list. And basically, it's a, a summary of what your company does. It could be one page max. It, it, generally, the RFPs will tell you how, how many, you know, uh, you may be limited on the number of words that you can use. But we want to do that. So we want to make sure that we're effectively communicating, articulating exactly what we're doing. We're answering the question. We're not putting a bunch of fluff in there because as a reader, you know, when I, I had to read 22 proposals that were average 50 pages each, uh, I, I don't want to look at a bunch of fluff. I wanted to get right to the point. That's what I'm looking for, the critical thinking skills. Okay, it acknowledges that you are in, intending to bid on this proposal and you're making an announcement. I am proposing on this. We're talking about the, the scope of services, the actual performance, whether it's product or service that you're going to perform. This is the heart, meat and potatoes of the country. Okay, we, I want to see methodologies. I want to see skilled staff. I want to see if you have any specialty skill or product or technology that you're using that you bring into the table. Those are the types of things that we're looking for in, in the proposal. So if you meet with us, we will help you put a strategy together. I cannot write it for you, but we can help you put the strategy together. We can help you bring out uh, your skill set and what makes you unique and to help you get a competitive edge to be able to compete. Uh, we can help you put a bid budget together, okay, uh, that makes you competitive. You know, generally in, in, the, in the government sector, your profit margins is maybe going to be between five to eight percent to make you in the competitive range you know maybe in the private sector a little bit more but we need to understand what that is we'll help you do that what are your actually fixed hard costs then we can add overhead then we can add a, pro a profit margin and then to help you understand how can we be competitive and what we can't be is to low bid 
because we had a client, she low bidded, she had a contract with the uh, county of LA and her, her material prices increased. She ended up losing $8,000 a year because, uh, and she didn't want to go back to, to ask for a re revision of the contract. So that's why it's real important that we understand our fixed costs and how to, to submit a, uh, a, a bid budget. Those are Andrew? very important things. Yes. Hi, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Um, we are just going over the time now and I wanted a few uh, minutes for a Q&A. We no, have- No problem. Okay, so, so if basically- if we have any other additional questions, um, we can always provide uh, the our, our personal emails and then we'll get in contact with you directly if the constituent has a, a, a question directly for you. Um, if there's any questions or concerns or if you'd like to bring up any um, questions that you have for anyone, please feel free to do so now. I have provided my email address in the chat and the phone number to the office as well. Um, you can always email me or contact me at the office and I'd be gladly to help and share resources. We do want to announce the next three webinars. It looks like September 1st, we have our grant webinar with the Health and Human Services. On September 22nd, we have our webinar with the Department of Justice and the 29th of September, we have our webinar with the Department of Veteran Affairs. So um, I also provided the link to register to those webinars in the chat. But again, if you have any questions at all, you can always reach out to me directly by calling the office or by the email address I provided in the chat. Um, without further ado, any questions, anyone?